clouds. Uh, so we move on to our next speaker. I'm very delighted to call upon our next speaker, our very young and dynamic uh, Dr. Arisha Alam, who's assistant professor in Department of Pediatrics, King, King George Medical University. I welcome you, Dr. Arisha. Thank you, ma'am. Ma'am, is my uh, screen visible? Yes, and you are audible. Okay. A very good afternoon to all of you. Today, I'm going to talk about autoimmune encephalitis in children. So my talk will include the definition of this syndrome, the epidemiology, the etiopathogenesis, when to suspect autoimmune encephalitis, then how is it different from the AES, which we commonly see, the clinical features of autoimmune encephalitis, the classification of autoimmune encephalitis, the differential diagnosis, how do we diagnose and finally treat the disorder, what are the complications, the prognosis, and then if the time permits, I have few cases to discuss. So talking about autoimmune encephalitis, it is an expanding group of clinical syndromes which is based upon the clinical phenotype and the associated autoantibody. These two together make up a syndrome. Now we should all know that this is an acquired disease and a treatable cause of encephalopathy, epilepsy and movement disorders in children. Often it poses a diagnostic challenge because a significant proportion of children do not exhibit detectable known antibodies. Now, this could be because the commercial assays which we are using, they're not sensitive enough to pick up the antibodies or it, they are new, anti uh, new antibodies which are yet to be discovered. This can affect all the ages starting from infancy to adults. Preferentially, it affects younger adults and children. It's a debilitating neurological disorder which imposes great economic burden on the family. Therefore, it's our uh, duty to early diagnose the disorder and treat it because then only we can have better neurocognitive outcomes. Looking back at the history of this syndrome, in about 1960, for the first time, lymphocytic infiltration of the median temporal lobe was identified in an adult patient with remote malignancy. So this was the first time when people started thinking about some autoimmune involvement in the encephalitis itself. Gradually, the diseases of the peripheral nervous system, like myasthenia, they discovered an autoantibodies involved in their pathogenesis. However, in 2004, the Vincent et al. They discovered the VGKC, that is a voltage-gated potassium channel antibody complex, which is responsible for the limbic encephalitis. However, the first autoimmune encephalitis to be reported was in 2007, that is the NMDA receptor, which is the most common encephalitis reported in children. And major part of my talk will be focused on this encephalitis. Now, since then, the spectrum of the disease has been expanding. So this is a simple PubMed search which shows you how new is this entity. I just searched with autoimmune encephalitis in children and we can see that before 2010 there is no publications. And even till 2016 we have only 10 publications in a year globally. So therefore this is an entity which was unrecognized uh, 10 to 15 years ago. Therefore we are very new with this. There are no specific guidelines. There are recommendations but no formal guidelines available for the treatment and diagnosis. Talking about the epidemiology, as we have seen that this is so new, so the data on the epidemiology of pediatric autoimmune encephalitis is very limited. The adult literature has found that the prevalence is about 13 patients in one lakh population. So if we extrapolate the data to the global population, across the globe, at least 1 million people are affected with this disorder. In children, the incidence has been found to be 1.5 per million children per year. However, from India, the rates are not known. Generally, this disorder contributes to the recurrence of encephalitis. Whenever there is a recurrence of encephalitis, especially HSV encephalitis, then we should suspect autoimmune encephalitis. Now, NMDR encephalitis is the most common cause of seropositive autoimmune encephalitis in children. And when we look up at the complete distribution of the encephalitis, it is about 4% of the total encephalitis. Now, this is taken up from this California encephalitis project. However, the newer literature shows that this autoimmune encephalitis, the proportion is rising. And now we have 20 to 30% of AES being contributed by this entity. This California project was a population-based study which found that the anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis surpassed any viral encephalitis. 
as we can see that it was seen in about 45 40.5 percent of the population whereas the other <coughs> infectious etiologies were even less in comparison to that now going talking about the etiology of autoimmune encephalitis the most common etiology in children are the infections now mostly they are these are the viral infections after the viral infections we have the uh, onset of the symptoms which point towards this encephalitis a study was done which uh, uh, tested for the anti nmdr antibodies in the csf in this hsv pcr proven children of encephalitis and they found that about 30% of these children had these antibodies we should always remember that whenever a child relapses after hsv encephalitis and at that time does not have the viral antigen positivity this attributes to about 20% of cases of anti nmdr encephalitis the other viral infections responsible are varicella zoster epstein barr virus hhv6 cmv hiv adeno and even rickettsial infection can contribute to this autoimmune encephalitis the other antibodies seen are the anti d2 receptor antibody which is responsible for the basal ganglia encephalitis anti gaba and anti amp receptor antibodies the second etiology is the paraneoplastic syndromes these are very less common in children more commonly seen in adults where there is an association with a tumor however in children we have tumor ovarian teratomas or testicular tumors or neuroblastoma which can be associated with this onset of the syndrome some vaccines after vaccines we can have this etiology the causes of can be influenza vaccine diphtheria or dpt vaccination polio je vaccination a certain subset we do not know the cause and they come under the category agree of unknown now after etiology what is the pathogenesis of this syndrome now these auto antibodies are formed they act against the neuronal cell surface proteins and the synaptic receptors which are involved in the synaptic transmission plasticity or neuronal excitability now why these antibodies are produced why do they start developing what are the trigger mechanisms it is unknown however it has been postulated that in some adolescents who have tumors the tumor antigen shares a molecular mimicry with the neuronal antigen as a result the antibodies which are produced against it acts against the neural tissue and causes immune mediated destruction another non specific viral infections which were the most common cause in children in these scenarios there is a loss of immune tolerance and increase in the blood brain permeability to the antigens the viral toxicity it causes the release of the brain specific new antigens and as a result then further and pathogenic antibodies are formed against these brain specific new antigens and they cause the destruction in some cases auto antibodies may be synthesized within the cns by the plasma cells itself now looking at the nmdr encephalitis specifically it is a ligand gated cation channel which is involved in the synaptic transmission it has two heteromers n1 and n2 subunit now this antibodies found against the n1 are responsible for this encephalitis what happens when these antibodies they bind to the receptor it causes an internalization of the receptor into the cell and the synaptic transmission decreases so these receptors are found on the gabagic neurons as a result the transmission to the gabagic neurons decreases so there is disinhibition of the excitatory pathways they decrease if they become increased so there is increased extracellular glutamate which is responsible for the hyperkinetic movement we see in this encephalitis the pathogenesis also depends upon the type of antigen against which the antibody is targeting it can be intracellular or it can be cell surface antigen so the difference between the two is that the intracellular ones are generally paraneoplastic they are mediated by the cytotoxic t cells and they respond poorly to the immunotherapy whereas the cell surface antigen commonly seen in children they are mediated by the humoral immune system and they have a good response to immunotherapy and a good outcome as well now what are the antigens what are the target sites as we have already seen there are two types intracellular and cell surface membrane so first discussing the cell surface ones so they can be either the ion channels like the nmda receptor ampa receptor and glycine receptor or they can be the meta metabolic channels like the dopamine d2 receptor gaba receptor a and b subunits m glutamate receptor 1 and the two another important cell surface antigens are caspar 2 and lg1 these two antigens are involved in the pathogenesis of limbic encephalitis nowadays there is increased literature about this mog antibody as well associated with demyelination 
in the intracellular antigen we have to remember few in antigens like anti uh, the hu hu antigen ma antigen gat 65 and cr mp5 so we should remember that the syndromes they are dependent upon the type of antibody which is being produced and now the phenotype depends upon the function of the target antigen against which this antibody acts because the function is modified and that modified function turns into the phenotype of the syndrome now this is the most important slide when to suspect autoimmune encephalitis whenever a child comes to you with a polysymptomatic syndrome involving multiple types of group of symptoms then you should always suspect autoimmune encephalitis so what are what the group can be encephalopathy seizures movement disorders psychiatric manifestations gait disturbances and autonomic instability as we can see they are all so much different from each other that is why it's called polysymptomatic and secondly the csf should show the features of inflammation with in the absence of any infection now talking about the other the subtypes of these uh, symptoms can be number one most important is the child has an abrupt onset without any preceding fever this disease has a sub acute course that is lasting from days to weeks there is a rapid decline in the neurological function of the child the child may also have a fluctuating course often there is autonomic instability the child may present with urinary fecal incontinence there may be cognitive slowing the child may develop delirium slipping into catatonia catatonia is a kind of state of immobility mutism and indifference to the surroundings and gait whenever a child comes to you with gait and balance disorders you should have this in in your mind as a dd when it is associated with other symptoms as well then after relapse from the treatment of viral encephalitis seizures may be dystonic seizure this is a classical seizure i'll be telling later on status epilepticus multifocal drug resistant epilepsy whenever there is involvement of the multiple domains like cognition and extra pyramidal symptoms and finally you should take a history of autoimmune disorder or concurrent malignancy in patient and in family now the recommendations they say that the autoimmune etiology should always be ruled out in any subacute onset unexplained epileptic form encephalopathy and in the recent onset mesial temporal lobe epilepsy no so this is a very important slide which helps to differentiate between infectious encephalitis and autoimmune encephalitis infectious as we all know is fever with altered sensorium with or without seizures so here fever is going to be seen in all of the patient in contrast in autoimmune fever is only seen in 50% of cases and there is a multitude of symptoms present rash is never seen in autoimmune encephalitis whereas in infectious rash may be seen like in scrub and dengue in infectious encephalitis the csf shows you severe lymphocytic pleocytosis whereas in autoimmune there is a milder form of pleocytosis the mri findings in the infectious encephalitis are infection specific that means the later and the important thing to remember here is a temporal lobe involvement in hsv we may have lateral temporal lobes involved versus the mesial temporal lobe involvement in the autoimmune encephalitis in autoimmune lateral temporal lobes are very less involved basal ganglia can be seen involved in both these entities however in the autoimmune encephalitis the mri is normal in about 70% of cases so why are we so much concerned to differentiate because it decides the treatment which is different between the two in infectious we need to give antibiotics and antivirals and in autoimmune we have to give immunotherapy now there are certain features that also point away from the diagnosis it can be like there is a plateauing of symptoms that means the symptoms are not worsening there is no continuous decline the cognition is remaining intact there is no impairment in the activities of the daily living and lastly purely psychiatric symptoms now this can be seen in the adults but it is very unlikely for children to have just psychiatric symptoms now few diagnostic criteria have been given uh, by uh, gross et al in 2016 which was published in lancet neurology it says that the diagnosis of this anti nmd receptor in encephalitis can be made when all of the three following criteria have been met so what are these three criteria number 1 the child should have a rapid onset of at least four of the six main groups of the symptoms second at least one of the abnormal laboratory study findings third reasonable exclusion of other disorders other disorders like the infections so what are the six major group of symptoms just remember these six major group number 1 is your behavioral symptoms number 2 is your speech abnormality third is the seizures 
Fourth are the movement disorders. Sixth is uh, the fifth is the altered consciousness, and finally autonomic instability. Now, what are the laboratory investigation? Either an abnormal EEG or an abnormal CSF. So that was a probable NMDA receptor encephalitis. That means when you are suspecting in a child on the basis of simple clinical phenotype and simple tests like CSF and EEG. Now, when do we call it a definitive anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis? When your antibody has come out to be positive, whether in CSF or in the serum. Second, in this scenario, we only require one or more of the six major groups. However, to call it probable without the antibodies, we need four groups, four group of symptoms to be present in the child. Now, coming to the classification of the syndrome, under this umbrella terminology of autoimmune encephalitis, we have different subtypes. So if you have proven immune mechanisms like anti-NMDR receptor encephalitis, <laughs> limbic encephalitis, few have strongly suggested immune mechanism like obsoclonal my obsoclonus myoclonus and cerebellar brainstem encephalitis, Bicostaff encephalitis, Hashimoto encephalitis, Rasmussen's encephalitis, and basal ganglia encephalitis. The possible immune mechanisms one are clippers, Rohard, PMP, and ophthalmoplegic migraine. So because of the constraint of the time, I cannot discuss every, every syndrome in detail. So I will only be focusing on general and anti-NMDR encephalitis. So coming to the clinical features of autoimmune encephalitis. So this anti-NMDR encephalitis, it is commonly seen in females in about 80% of cases. In less than 12 years of age, the male predominance kind uh, just increases about to 40%. Generally, the child may have three clinical phenotypes. Number one is a classic form. Number two is the psychiatric form, where the psychiatric features predominate. It has good outcomes. Third is a catatonia predominant, which I've already told, the immobile, the mute, who is completely indifferent and having other psychiatric features as well. So this one has a very poor outcome. So what is the classic form? Now, this classic form is commonly seen in adolescents, may not be very peculiarly seen in young children. It has stages. So the first stage is your prodromal stage, which may be seen in 50% of cases only. This lasts for about days to weeks. Here you may have headache, you may have fever, viral symptoms. The stage two is the psychiatric manifestations or the neurological manifestations. So after this prodromal stage, the child develops these two kind of features. So in the psychiatric manifestation, the child can have a progressive anxiety, agitation, aggression, bizarre behavior, emotional ability like the child just has inappropriate laughter about mood disturbances in the form of mania is extremely elated all the time. And finally, mutism. The neurological features, they include the memory problem. There is short-term memory loss. There is speech abnormality, cognitive decline, and sleep disturbances. Now, this stage also lasts for weeks to months. So it can be very long also. Therefore, you need to have a suspicion about the syndrome when the child presents to you. So here I would like to add that in pediatric population, mostly the stage two starts with the neurological manifestation. Whereas in the adult population, it starts with the psychiatric manifestations. Now, then it progresses to the advanced stage, that is the stage three. Here, finally, the child develops altered consciousness, which can be in the form of lethargy or complete altered behavior and altered sensorium. Seizures are seen in 80% of cases. They can be generalized, focal, or maybe status. This is some special type of uh, classical seizure which is seen in autoimmune encephalitis called the dystonic seizure or the facio-brachial seizures. So here you can see there is myoclonic movement involving one side of the body, one side of the uh, upper limb and one side of the face. So this happens in children and this is very much classical for limbic encephalitis especially. Then the movement disorders, they can be in the form of orofacial dyskinesias, Orofacial dyskinesia means abnormal, move, abnormal movements of the involuntary movements of the face, like puckering of the lips, lip smacking, tongue thrusting, or grimacing. The child is smiling in between. So, other ones are the coriform movements, rigidity, opisthotonic posturing, and tremors. And finally, in few cases, we can have autonomic instability as well. So, this stage and these manifestations should be very clear to us, and we should remember this then only we can suspect this encephalitis in children. Now, the differences between adults and children, clinical presentations have already highlighted that in adults, the initial feature is psychosis. In children, we have the neurological manifestations. 
Second difference is the autonomic dysfunction. It's very mild in children. They present with tachycardia, hyperthermia, and hypertension. Now, this is often seen in our ICUs when we admit a child with a diagnosis of AES. Later on, he starts developing hypertension along with tachycardia. So this is autonomic instability. We should be quick to pick it and we should be suspecting autoimmune etiology in this child. Whereas in adults, we can have central hypoventilation and arrhythmias. Important to highlight is that children generally have multiple symptoms. They don't present with single symptoms. And this monosymptomatic presentation is only seen in 1% of cases. Now, what is unique to children? As we know that this disorder can be seen in toddlers, infants, the youngest case has been reported of about six months old child. So what is different and what is unique? Actually, it is the behavior changes in children are very difficult to discern. They may present with simple irritability, new onset, temper tantrums, agitation and aggression. Mutism is quite, a, it's, it can be a quite eye opener for us. It can be a very important uh, pointer towards this etiology. Some atypical forms are like autistic re like regression. The child has, did not had autism before, but now he has similar kind of regression in his behavior. Gait disorder, cerebellar ataxia is more common in children than in adults. And sometimes the children can ha have simple on and off phenomena in the level of consciousness. Now, this was a two year study, two year study, which was done at AIMS. It showed that the symptoms were seen in mostly insidious in most of the patients and 80% had subacute presentation. The male and female gender, there was no gender predominance. Both had equal proportion of cases. Preceding flu-like illness was seen in about 55% of cases. So they, these people, they found main two types of presentations. Number one was progressive extrapyramidal syndrome. That is different type of movement disorders, dyskinesias or dystonia. And along with it, there was global neuroregression. This was seen in about 45% of cases. The second type was epileptic form encephalopathy. The child started having seizures and now he has become encephalopathic. This was seen in about 30% of cases. And the rest had both these kind of features. Now looking at the distribution of the clinical features which they found were seizures was the most common presentation, the most common feature seen in 90% of cases, extra followed by extra pyramidal symptoms in 75% of cases, psychiatric manifestations in 40%, 36% of cases, sleep disturbances in 20% of cases, and autonomic instability and stereotypy were very minimal in 9%. So we can see these are the main three things which we need to focus, seizures, extrapyramidal symptoms, and psychiatric manifestations. Talking about the seizures, mostly they had the generalized type of seizures, few had focal, and 20% also had myoclonic type of seizures. In the extrapyramidal features, the most common presentation was orofacial and limb dyskinesias, which I have already talked about. It was seen in about 64% of cases, followed by generalized dystonia and hemidystonia. Mutism was seen in about 36% of cases. Psychiatric manifestations were like hallucinations and delusion in about 9%, emotional lability, hyperactivity, aggression. So any child who was not hyperactive initially and now suddenly has become hyperactive. So it, it is also a pointer. Now, this is a very nice graphical representation of the evolution of the symptoms in the cases before the patient presented to the current, this particular center of uh, excellence aims. So here we can see, see at the patient number three, here you can see that initially the symptom of extra pyramidal symptoms, they lasted for about 1.5 months. And after that, the child developed seizures and autonomic instability. Similarly, as we can see in patient number two, this extra pyramidal symptoms lasted for four months and then he developed add-on psychiatric manifestation. So here you can see how the symptoms slowly evolve over the period of time. Now, this is another six-year study from Nimhans. They tried to find out the proportion of psychiatric manifestations in these NMDR patients. They found that about 48% of cases had psychiatric features as the first symptoms. And what symptoms they had? Mostly in 66% of cases, they had inappropriate crying. Others were social withdrawal, unprovoked anger, talking to self irrelevantly, unprovoked screaming behavior. So we need to know about all these kind of manifestations which we can see in our children. Now, once we have thought about autoimmune encephalitis, what are the other differential diagnoses which can be, uh, should all, also be ruled out? Number one and the most important is the CNS infections. Second is Wilson's disease. Third may be CNS vasculitis or toxins. Some inborn error of metabolism like maple syrup urine disease, brain 
tumors and ssp how do you diagnose a case of autoimmune encephalitis history is the gold mark you have to take a good history of the from the parents and you should always ensure that the person who is giving the history is reliable so the history points towards a particular clinical syndrome now this should be supported by other investigations like mri csf serology auto antibodies and then we need to screen for the tumors the other possible dd which we talk should always be ruled out so this is a simple flow chart number one step one is when we suspect a multifocal pathology in the brain when a child has a polysymptomatic presentation we go ahead with the brain mri we get a eeg done second step is we confirm the inflammatory etiology and rule out the competing possibilities so here we get a lumbar puncture done and send for csf neuronal and auto antibodies we get the serum neuronal auto antibodies done as well now third step is we screen for the associated neoplasm so in children we have to do ct uh, abdomen to rule out uh, your neuroblastoma ct or ultrasound pelvis for the ovarian teratoma and testicular ultrasound for the testicular tumors now talking about the findings which may get which we may get on the mri brain scan the classic finding is your t2 or flare signal hyper intensity in the mesial temporal lobe these may be unilateral or they may be bilateral in 66% of the anti nmdr encephalitis which is about 70% to round, round off they have normal mri whereas in anti gaba a receptor and anti d2 receptor encephalitis mri is mostly abnormal now the another important role of mri is to rule out the uh, the other dds like vascular vasculitis exols or other structural uh, causes what do we see in the mri in anti nmdr only 30% are abnormal here you can have non specific cortical and subcortical t2 signal abnormalities these cortical changes can be seen in the mesial temporal lobe or in the cerebral cortex especially the fronto basal areas we may also have white matter changes spinal cord can also be involved and on the serial mris these changes they turn into cerebral atrophy second is a limbic encephalitis this is a classical form which shows mesial temporal lobe hyper intensities followed by the mesial temporal sclerosis third the common uh, the third starking encephalitis with the mri change is the anti d2 receptor encephalitis they have selective bilateral basal ganglia t2 signal abnormalities anti gaba a receptor is similarly just like nmda have multifocal cortical subcortical changes this is a t2 weighted mri which is showing you uh, signal changes a very subtle signal in the figure a subtle signal changes in your left medial temporal lobe the arrow is pointing towards it in the b section this is a coronal section t2 flare it shows you similar signal changes in the left medial temporal lobe now the a the a image it shows you the classic limbic encephalitis where we have bilateral mesial temporal lobe t2 signal changes in the figure b here we can see the signal changes are present but they are not as marked as a so you have to be keen in observing at the mri so that you can come to good and correct diagnosis the figure c it shows an mri from an nmd anti nmd receptor encephalitis patient which is normal and this is as expected because 70% of cases are normal mri this uh, d d figure is also from limbic encephalitis here we can see that there is a uh, left sided one sided frontal cortical and subcortical t2 hyper intensities in the figure e there are bilateral t2 cortical and subcortical hyper intensities present in the fronto parietal areas and this f this was a case a, a zero negative case is it shows you uh, t2 changes in your left sided parietal area now mri imaging mri brain is the uh, main it, uh, modality neuroimaging modality which we go ahead of but in some cases we may go ahead with functional imaging so the indications are when they, you have a normal mri scan but the patient has a typical picture typical clinical eeg picture of autoimmune encephalitis so commonly you see a global hypometabolism in most of the cases in some you may have focal hypometabolism in patients who have seizures there may be some hypermetabolism present so this is an image which shows the uh, pet uh, the pet uh, scan images here the blue areas are the normal metabolism the green is the hypometabolism so the a is your pre treatment and b is the post treatment in a you can see all this temporal lobe area is green 
So that means there is hypometabolism over here, bilaterally present. Whereas after treatment, this green area decreases. So that is a beautiful response to the immunotherapy. The second investigation is the EEG. In most of the cases, we get diffuse slowing or epileptic form abnormalities in the temporal lobes. Second common uh, diagnosis which we can make on EEG is a non-convulsive status epilepticus. In NMDR encephalitis, EEG is abnormal in all of the patients. However, this delta brush, which is very significant and diagnostic of NMDR encephalitis, it is seen in only about 30% of cases. So what are these delta brush? These are beta delta complexes. As we see in this diagram, overall the background is very slow. Slow waves are present, delta waves. But on the top of these slow waves, we can see this fast activity, fast beta activity. So this is called a delta brush. This is similarly second image of EEG trying to emphasize on this delta brush. You can see this fast beta activity on the top of a slow wave. Now the same study from Ames, uh, they found that about 73% of their patients had normal CSA and about 80% of their patients had normal MRI. But EEG was abnormal in about 100% of cases. So the background slowing was a consistent feature. And apart from that, they also had some epileptic form activities in focal, multifocal, or generalized activities. Now coming to the laboratory evaluation. CSF examination is the most important test. CSF is found to be abnormal in 80% of cases. You get moderate lymphocytic pleocytosis, increased protein. Some cases may have oligoclonal bands. And then you also need to test for the infectious causes. Secondly, we may do a metabolic screen if we strongly uh, suspect a metabolic disorder some blood investigations and screening for non-specific autoimmunity like ANA, TPO, and ANCA should be done. Finally, coming to the confirmatory, it, uh, confirmatory diagnostic modality, that is your autoantibody testing. So once it is positive, you call a case a definitive, and if it is not positive, you call it a suspected case. Now, we should the recommendations, they say that we should test for both the CSF and serum samples for the antibodies. However, if we have a financial constraint, then we should all, always go ahead with the CSF sampling because why, why, why should we go ahead with the CSF sampling only? Because the sensitivity of picking up antibodies is higher in the CSF and these antibodies, they correlate better with the outcome. And if the child has received some prior treatment from outside, then also the antibodies may be positive in the CSF. Now, among the patients of autoimmune encephalitis, only 44% of patients have a positive autoantibody. Another question is that whether we should repeat the antibodies on the follow-ups. So because this is not a very studied area, so at, at the present moment, it is not indicated. This is the common autoantibody panel, which is prescribed. These are the main antibodies commonly involved. That is anti-NMDAR, anti-LG1, anti-CASPER2, anti-GABA, BNA receptor, and anti-EMPA. So we generally are not able to go ahead with this complete panel because it is very costly, about 30,000. So generally, we go ahead with anti-NMDR only because we know this is the most common one. Now, second hint for um, second hint for ordering for the autoantibody can be depending upon the type of the symptomatology, uh, which it's too huge, so we cannot go into it. Now, coming to the study which was done at Netherlands in over three years, it found that about 90% of their patients had anti-NMDR. So that is also one of the reasons that if we have to test autoantibodies, we test with this anti-NMDR. The other ones were anti-AMPA receptor and anti-LG1 receptor. Another multi-center study from China over three years found that anti-NMDR was the most common antibody seen in 81% of cases, followed by anti-GABA, anti-LG1 and anti-CASPER. In 4% of cases, more than one antibody was seen. Now, from India, we have a study from AIMS over three years. Here also the same presentation, same uh, pattern was noticed. That is the anti-NMDR was the maximum one in 24 cases, followed by anti-D2, anti-GAD, anti-TPO. Here, about 78% of the children were antibody positive in this study. And more of them were females. Now, coming to the treatment principles. So, these are very important to understand. Because the patients, when treated with immunotherapy, they fare better than those who are not given immunotherapy. Secondly, early initiation of immunotherapy leads into better prognosis. So whenever you are suspecting autoimmune encephalitis, Im in immediately the empirical therapy should be initiated. We don't need to wait for the antibody results. And whenever there is resource constraints, I've already told CSF is the preferred sample. 
in unaffordable patients empirical therapy should be initiated without going ahead with the auto antibody sampling after excluding the infectious etiologies so what all treatment options do we have we have first line treatment second line therapy and third line therapy the first line therapy is your iv methylprednisolone iv ig or plasma exchange second line therapy is your rituximab or cyclophosphamide third line therapy is your bortezomib and tocilizumab and then it is followed by the maintenance therapy so the first line therapy as we have already talked includes your steroids iv steroids iv immunoglobulin or plasma exchange so iv methylprednisolone is given in the dose of 30 mg per kg per day for 3 to 5 days the maximum for one dose is 1 gram now this iv methylprednisolone should be clubbed with either iv ig or with plasma exchange iv ig is given in the dose of 2 gram per kg over 5 days plasma exchange we have to do 5 to 7 exchanges on alternate days each exchange we have to remove 50 ml per kg so the question is that which is better which we should prefer iv ig or plex so this evidence does not there is no evidence which can state that one is superior to the other so depending upon the availability at your center you can pick one corticosteroids are the cornerstone because they have a very broad spectrum anti inflammatory activity and very good blood brain barrier penetration now this first line treatment is followed by a maintenance therapy which is given either as oral steroids or we can choose monthly pulse steroids with iv methylprednisolone or pulse iv ig therapy whichever is more feasible for you the oral steroids we give prednisolone 2 mg per kg per day for a month followed by taper iv methylprednisolone is given 30 mg per kg once monthly iv ig is 1 gram per kg once monthly now this is followed by a slow tapering over 6 months now prolonged course of up to 12 months may be required in severe cases like nmdr in nmdr we, we may be needing one year regimen of maintenance therapy therefore this duration of the treatment is depend it uh, requires individualization it depends upon the patient's symptomatology his response to the therapy uh, along with this when you are giving continuous steroids you need to give vitamin d and calcium you need to look for sugar and bp monitoring now in certain patients they are not either they are not responding to the steroids or they are having uh, relapses on the steroids or they have developed side effects due to the steroids then you can use some steroid sparing agents like azathioprine and mycophenolate mofetil however there are no rcts available in children which can state that which modality is superior to the other modality now this was a multi institutional international study done over a five years period which found that the response to the first line therapy in within the four weeks was seen in about 53% of patients so that means 50% of patients fail on the first line therapy now these patients who responded to the first line therapy had a very good outcome of 96% cases had good outcome at two year follow up whereas the ones who failed to the first line therapy about 57 received the second line therapy and they had better outcomes versus the one who did not receive the second line therapy when these were followed up it was found that 81% have a good outcome at 2 years so this shows that the outcomes keep on improving over the time so what are the factors which help you to get a good outcome in your patient is number one early treatment second use of timely second line therapy and lack of icu admission in the patient now coming to the second line therapy it is given when the first line therapy does not work within 14 days so you have to make the decision within the 14 days if it is not working you step up to the second line secondly if you are not able to taper off the steroids or iv ig by the 6 months or there are relapses during this time then you should upgrade to the second line therapy so the choices for the second line are rituximab and cyclophosphamide rituximab is a preferred drug in children because of a better safety profile it is an anti cd20 monoclonal antibody it is given four doses weekly 375 mg per meter square it can be followed by a six monthly uh, uh, bolus we need to what uh, what we are trying to do is we are going to decrease the b cell levels so the targeted levels are cd19 less than 0.05% therefore b cell measurement should be done at least 4 weeks after the dosing to check for its effectivity the side effects are well tolerated pgi mr chandigarh had tried to use a lower dose of about 300 mg per meter square in two of their children and they had equally good effect no cyclophosphamide the indications are only the ones who fail to rituximab it is given as monthly iv infusions 500 to 1000 mg per meter square 
for six to nine months. The limitations are risk of infertility and secondary malignancies. So this is what we can see that rituximab is the favored drug. A multi-center study was done to look at the safety of rituximab in pediatric autoimmune disease, CNS disease. 144 children were looked up at, and it was found that rituximab was beneficial in 87% of cases, which is a good number. And this benefit was greater when this rituximab was started early in the disease course. Rituximab was generally given after a median duration of six months, because generally the six months is a period when you will be trying the first line therapy. So we can see the infusion adverse effects were only seen in 12.5% cases. The infectious adverse events, which are very much dreaded, were seen in only 7.6% of cases. Hypogamma globinemia, which also we suspect, was also seen in only 18% of cases. 96% of patients had a good response and they showed the B cell depletion. Dr. Arisha, I'm so sorry to interrupt. Uh, can we summarize in five minutes? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. So coming to the third line therapy, these are the novel agents which are used when both the first and the second line agents fail. We don't have much experience with these, they're limited to, and we don't have any general recommendations as well. So one is bortezomib, which is a protease inhibitor. Second is a tocilizumab, that is your interleukin-6 inhibitor. So this was tried because it was found that the CSF of these patients had increased interleukin-6. The tocilizumab is effective in about 60% of cases and it's superior to giving a repeat rituximab dose. In few children of refractory cases, intrathecal steroids and methotrexate has also been tried. Now coming to the symptomatic therapy, which is equally important. Seizures are very common and they, they are refractory, so they require more than one anti-epileptic drugs. We need to give sedating agents like benzodiazepine, anti-epileptics, clonidine or chloral hydrate. Always remember that do not give neuroleptics like haloperidol because they increase the rigidity and then neuromuscular mal neuroleptic malignant syndrome chances. Intubation and mechanical ventilation are required in patients of hypoventilation. And those where they have movement disorders resistant to the medicines, we need to give IV sedation with propofol or midazolam or neuromuscular blockage. If the patient has tumor, it needs to be removed because it improves the response to immunotherapy. Coming to the management of relapses, although it's very uncommon, Whenever the child has a relapse, you just need to repeat the dosing of the first line agents. But if after that repeat also there is no response, then you go to the second line. In few patients who have multiple relapses, so here comes the role of chronic immunosuppressive therapy like azathioprine or mycophenolate. The treatment of this disorder needs a multidisciplinary approach. Now finally coming to the prognosis of this disorder. 80% of the patients have a full recovery. Although it is very slow, it takes two years, the recovery happens in the reverse order of the presentation of symptoms. So the symptoms of first to improve are the autonomic instability, level of consciousness and seizures. The last to go are social interactions, language and executive functions. So mortality is about 5% in these cases. The best prognosis is of anti-voltage gated potassium channel encephalitis and anti-NMDR also has a good response. Worst is of anti-GAD encephalitis. Relapses are only seen in 15% of cases. They are generally monosymptomatic. So this is different from the first presentation where they were polysymptomatic. So what are the neurological sequelae possible in these children? They may have persistent quadriparesis or hemiparesis if they are not treated timely. They may have aphasia. They may have frontal lobe disturbances like poor uh, planning, judgment, apathy, and sleep disturbances. So this is a very simple case. Ma'am, do I have five minutes? Okay, we will take the case. Okay. So it is very simple. An eight years old boy came to you with a history of three weeks, focal seizures, hyperkinetic movement disorder, and mutism. He was admitted in the hospital for about two months. On investigations, it was found that the CSF shows lymphocytic pleocytosis. Sundaram. So what will be, what all will we be uh, suspecting in this child? So here we can see that this is a very long history. Here the pointers are different types of group of symptoms. Seizures are there. Movement disorder is there. There is mutism. So because of this polysymptomatic etiology, apart from encephalitis, we should always keep the DD of autoimmune encephalitis. So then we went ahead with this viral studies and the antibodies panel. It came out to be negative 
So then what will be your diagnosis? So here we will be calling it as a suspected autoimmune encephalitis. Although st still the antibodies did not come out to be positive. So we call it suspected. Had they come out to be positive, we would be calling it definitive. So they are treated with the first line therapy, IVIG, along with IV steroids. 14 days after the first line therapy, there was no improvement in the child. So we immediately escalated to the rutuximab. And within five days of rituximab, there was improvement and the complete recovery to the normal baseline just took six weeks. So this shows that timely escalation can give good results. Now, this is a second case from AIMS 2014, which was published in 2014. Here, a 10 years old girl came with focal seizures and generalized seizures and cognitive decline for the last four months. Her MRI changes, they showed the mesial temporal signal changes. Anti multiple anti-epileptics were tried. The seizures did not control. Then right amygdala hippocampectomy was also done, but the seizures persisted. Until then also people did not think about the autoimmune possibility. Now, but still even after, then later on in view of the cognitive decline, the panel was sent and it came out to be positive for anti NMDR receptor antibodies. Immunotherapy was started, the seizures responded very nicely and in the follow up, there were significant improvement in cognition and seizures. So coming to the key messages, we should be aware of autoimmune encephalitis. We should know the phenotype of these cases because timely diagnosis and treatment is very important in such cases. It should be suspected in a child with polysymptomatic presentation, a combination of psychiatric illness, movement disorders, dysautonomia, and central hypoventilation should, be, should lead to a suspicion of anti-NMDR encephalitis. In older children, you have neuropsychiatric symptoms as a first presentation. In younger children, you have status epilepticus. Now, this entity should always be considered as a differential for acute encephalitis syndrome. And all the presumed JE cases with negative serology, they should be tested for anti-NMDR antibodies. This autoimmune encephalitis, it is a treatable cause of acute encephalitis. It should be treated if, even if we cannot investigate the patient after ruling out the other alternatives. Because early initiation of therapy improves the outcome, the first line therapies are corticosteroids, IVIG, and plasma exchange. Don't delay the escalation to the second line therapy when there is no improvement in your child within 10 to 14 days of first line therapy. The first line therapy simultaneously need to be continued when you are escalating to the second line therapy. And finally, in the second line drugs, rituximab is the preferred choice. Now, this is some suggested reading. If you, you can have a look at it. Thank you for your patient listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Arisha. That was an excellent summary of your presentation and updating us uh, with often underdiagnosed condition, uh, which is autoimmune encephalitis. Uh, 